Hello, Physiology 142 students. Welcome to the lecture on fluid and electrolyte balance. You've probably heard it said once before that humans are primarily water, and that's correct. Uh, the human body varies between somewhere between 45% and 73% water, and it depends both on age and gender. If we look at infants, they are almost 73% water, but as they age and become adolescents and adults, the body water goes down. So men are typically 60% body water, and females are typically 50%, and that's because females often have more body fat. If we look at the percentage of water as we age, it goes down even to 45% in older people. Now, the percentage of water in different body structures can vary dramatically. For example, if we look here at the muscle, you can see that muscle is about 70% water, same as skin. But if you look at something like, um, let's say, the teeth, they're 8 to 10%, and bones are 20 to 25%. So regardless of the concentration, water is really important because it's the solvent, it's the medium in which all these different chemical reactions with respiration, metabolism, it's the medium in which all these different reactions are occurring. All right, this slide just shows the distribution of water through different compartments in the body. And what you should notice first, is there are two main compartments. There is something called the intracellular compartment, which is filled with intracellular fluid, and then there's the extracellular fluid or extracellular compartment. So the intracellular fluid comprises the majority of the body water in the body, about 25 liters, about six gallons, or 40% of body weight. On the other hand, the extracellular fluid is about 15 liters or 20% of body weight. What you can see here is that the extracellular fluid is subdivided into two compartments. We have interstitial fluid, and this is the fluid that's in between the cells. It's literally outside the blood vessels, but not inside the cells. It's the interstitial or in-between fluid. And of course, we have our plasma fluid, which is in our bloodstream. And plasma volume is only about three liters in most people because the other two liters of blood volume are actually made up of blood cells. So big picture, there are two compartments, an extracellular and an intracellular. The intracellular compartment has the majority of the fluid volume, but the extracellular compartment uh, has a lot of volume too, and that's comprised of the interstitial fluid, which is in between the cells, and the intravascular fluid, or the blood plasma. So as we said before, water is a very important component of the human body. One, because it's the solvent in which all the other molecules are dissolved. A solvent is just something that dissolves things. So water is a very great solvent because it's good at dissolving things like organic molecules, like glucose. It's good at dissolving urea. It's good at dissolving a lot of different things. So it's a great solvent. The solutes that we have in the body are things that are dissolved in that watery medium. And we generally classify these solvents as either electrolytes or non-electrolytes. So non-electrolytes are parts of the solvents or they're solutes that uh, do not ionize and do not have a charge. So examples here would be, for example, your glucose molecule, which is right here, or this is your creatinine molecule, or we have a molecule of urea, or even a protein. All of these can be dissolved in fluid, and so they all uh, qualify as non-ionic solutes. The second type of solute that we find in body fluids is something called electrolytes. Electrolytes are compounds that dissociate into positively charged and negatively charged ions when immersed in water. For example, if you take a look up top here, you can see that we have some sodium chloride. And this is organized first up here in a crystal. Uh, it has this sort of lattice-like architecture. When we put those sodium chloride in the water, it tends to break that down and those sodium chloride atoms actually dissociate into positively and negatively charged ions. So this is why we call it an electrolyte because it dissociates into ions and these ions can actually help to uh, carry an electrical current. So electrolytes are important in the body because they generate a great amount of osmotic power, much more than most non-electrolytes. And we'll talk about why that's important. So back to extracellular fluid and intracellular fluid. Each of these fluid compartments has a distinctive uh, pattern of electrolytes. Now remember that the extracellular fluid comprise the blood and interstitial fluid and also the cerebral spinal fluid, whereas the intracellular fluid is made up 
only of what's inside the cells. So let's take a look at what ions are important. Okay, here's a graph and I know sometimes they're confusing, but first of all, I wanna point out that these two things, our blood and interstitial fluid, are both part of our extracellular fluid, ECF. And what we're gonna find out is that they are very similar in ionic composition and that intracellular fluid is very different. So first, let's look at sodium. Sodium's down here on the bottom left, okay? You can see that there's a lot of sodium in our blood plasma, and there's also a lot of sodium in our interstitial fluid. So they're very, very similar. Let's take a look at chloride. Okay, a lot of chloride in blood plasma, a lot of chloride in our interstitial fluid as well. Okay, but now let's take a look at potassium. So potassium, we have hardly any in the blood or interstitial fluid, but we have a lot inside the cells. Same with phosphate. Phosphate, a lot inside the cells, not much uh, down here where we have our interest, uh, sorry, our extracellular fluids. So the bottom line is the two extracellular fluids, blood plasma and interstitial fluid are very similar. They contain lots of sodium, lots of chloride. On the other hand, the intracellular fluid is very different than the other two. It contains primarily potassium ions and phosphate ions. Okay, before we talk about how we exchange fluids between compartments, let's talk about how we exchange nutrients and other molecules. Well, it's actually a fairly complex process, but it can go into one of three ways, either diffusion, facilitated diffusion, or active transport. Now remember that diffusion was simply the movement of something from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And so this is what happens in the respiratory tract. When we breathe air in, the oxygen diffuses from our alveoli into the blood capillaries because there's simply more oxygen in the lungs than in the capillaries, so simple diffusion. Same thing happens in the tissues. As that oxygen is transported by our systemic blood vessels to the tissues, that oxygen diffuses into the tissues and CO2 diffuses out because of a concentration gradient. Okay, other methods of exchange include facilitated diffusion, which basically uses an exchange protein and something called active transport. We talked about active transport a little bit in the last chapter, and this is a type of transport that uses energy to push molecules against their concentration gradient. Okay, now let's talk about how fluids move between compartments. They move chiefly using either osmotic or hydrostatic pressure. First of all, we'll talk about hydrostatic pressure. So this is the pressure generated by the heart and the ventricles as they contract, they generate a force on the fluid, on the blood, and that hydrostatic pressure is very, very high at the arterial end of a capillary bed. And it causes stuff to leak out through the process of filtration, okay? things move out of that blood vessel through just simple hydrostatic pressure. And we call this process filtration or bulk flow. Now let's talk about osmotic pressure. So you've heard the term osmosis before, right? Osmosis had to do with the movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. And remember what determined where water goes. Well, basically water is always gonna go to the greater area of solute concentration. Or put another way, solutes really suck. Solutes suck, okay? So anywhere there's more solute, that's where the water's gonna go. So let's take a look at the water uh, glass down here on the left-hand side. You can see it's divided by a semi-permeable membrane that's gonna let water through, but it won't let salt through. Now, where do we have more salt? Where there is more salt on the right-hand side, which means there's less water, and what does salt do? Well, salt sucks. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna pull the water from the left side to the right side, and that's exactly what happens. If you look over on the right side, this is what happens. All the water, or a lot of it, gets pulled to the right-hand side because the right-hand side was saltier. So simply put, just remember that solutes or salts suck. <clears throat> okay, let's look at how this affects something called reabsorption. We said before that blood was squirted out of the capillary beds by the process of filtration, which came from hydrostatic pressure, but now we're gonna look at the process of reabsorption. Reabsorption involves a uh, force called blood colloid osmotic pressure. So blood colloid osmotic pressure is generated here by the albumin molecules that are in the bloodstream. Once the hydrostatic pressure has been lost from the blood vessel, 
and there's no more you know, hydrostatic pressure on that blood vessel, the excess fluid that was forced out into the interstitial spaces will be sucked back in by an osmotic force, and this is called blood colloid osmotic pressure. And those blood colloids, once again, are our albumin molecules, those little green guys. They're helping to act as a solute, and what do solids do? They suck, so they're sucking the blood plasma back in. This brings us to something called Starling's Law of the Capillaries. And remember, we have filtration that goes on at the arterial end of a capillary bed, but we also have reabsorption going on at the venous end. So at the arterial end, the blood hydrostatic pressure is forcing stuff out. And at the venous end, the uh, blood colloid osmotic pressure is bringing stuff back in. So for most capillary beds, the amount of reabsorption is almost equal to the amount of filtration. So all things being equal, those numbers are almost the same. Uh, the only difference here is that excess fluid that is not reabsorbed is going to be picked back up by our lymphatic vessels. Part of the job of the lymphatic system was to suck up excess interstitial fluid and eventually return that to venous circulation. Well, what happens if this doesn't work properly? We get a process called edema. Edema is a process that happens when we get either too much filtration or not enough reabsorption. So let's look at the potential causes. First of all, excess filtration. Maybe we have hypertension, our blood pressure is simply too high, and so there's not enough blood colloid osmotic pressure to balance this. Uh, this can also happen because our capillaries are maybe more permeable than they should be because of different medications. Uh, the other cause is inadequate reabsorption. For something's happening that is impeding reabsorption. Oftentimes this could be because we have a decreased concentration of plasma proteins. These plasma proteins like albumin are made in the liver and if the liver is damaged or the person is severely malnourished they cannot manufacture these plasma proteins and as a result you get this kind of thing here. You can see that this leg looks kind of big and if you push in on it right there you get this pitting edema. So this is a classical sign of excess accumulation of interstitial fluid. You can also see in the picture at right where the girl has a normal uh, right leg, but her left leg is much, much bigger. So something's going on to uh, affect reabsorption, or either that or too much filtration. Now we're going to talk about water balance. So by definition, water output and water intake must balance one another if we're not to have some kind of weird disorder. For an average person, we're going to be drinking and urinating, or at least getting rid of, about 2.5 liters per day. And actually, only about 60% of that is going to be urine. So water intake comes from the beverages we drink. It also comes from our food, and we actually make some metabolic water. And our water output, again, is about 60% of that is lost through urine, but the rest is lost through perspiration, feces, and something called insensible water loss. Insensible water loss is the water that is lost through the vapor in your breathing and also the non-detectable uh, moisture that's lost through your squint, skin, the moisture that is not sweat. So this diagram just shows a handy little comparison of water intake and water output. So water intake is on the left hand side. You can see that first of all, beverages such as water, tea, coffee, beer, whatever it is, comprise about 60% or 1.5 liters of the intake. Foods comprise another 30% or about 750 uh, milliliters. And then your metabolism actually generates about 10% of your total water budget or about 250 milliliters. Now let's look at the right hand side. So we said before the majority of water lost in the body is lost through the urine about 60% or 1.5 liters, uh, about 8% is lost in sweat, and about 28%, this is very interesting, is lost as insensible water loss. Again, through water vapor in your breathing and things like that, Rem miraculously, only about 4% of your water is actually lost through feces, unless you have diarrhea. If we look in areas of the world that have lots of diarrheal diseases, people actually can very quickly become dehydrated because they aren't able to hold on to the water uh, that is lost in the diarrhea, and it can actually be very, very life-threatening. Now we're going to look at maintenance of the fluid osmolality. Now, osmolality is a funny sounding word. It sounds like osmosis, which had to do with the movement of water across the membrane. And think about what determined which way water was going to go. That's right, it was solutes. So osmolality here is basically a measurement of how salty a solution is.
So as we become dehydrated, our blood and extracellular fluid begins to proportionally become more salty because we're losing water. And so this increase in osmolality will stimulate us to drink and it will also stimulate a hormone called ADH. And we're gonna take a look at what effects uh, those processes have on the body. So in this diagram, we're looking at the stimulus and effects of dehydration on the drinking reflex. So the primary stimulus for taking a drink of water is an increase in the osmolality of the extracellular fluid. That is, your blood becomes proportionally more salty, as does your interstitial fluid, as you lose body water through evaporation, etc. Okay, this is sensed by the osmoreceptors in our hypothalamus. That was located just above our pituitary, pituitary gland. And our hypothalamus thirst center then sends this sensation of thirst uh, to the cortex. So the person says, well, I'm thirsty. And they also think about, hey, my mouth feels very parched and stuff like that. And so I wanna go ahead and take a drink. After they take a drink, they're gonna absorb some of that water from their GI tract. And that's gonna make the osmolality of the extracellular fluid go back down again, and it's gonna restore our plasma volumes. So this again is a negative feedback loop that's there to make sure that we stay adequately hydrated. Now talking about water output, there is facultative water loss and there's obligatory water loss. Facultative water loss is adjustable, and we talked about it last time uh, in our lecture on the urinary system, but obligatory water loss is obligatory. It has to happen no matter what. And let's talk about where that obligatory water loss comes from. Well, first of all, we have a fair amount of insensible water loss through our breathing and through our skin that we really can't control, uh, but we also have to adjust our urine volume. We actually have a minimum volume of urine uh, in order for our kidneys to work efficiently, and that volume is about 500 milliliters. If we are not consuming enough fluid to produce this volume, we're actually gonna have a buildup of metabolic waste products, something called uremia, and that's gonna be a buildup of urea and stuff like that in the blood, and that's not very, very good. So let's talk about some disorders of water balance. First of these, we're gonna look at a severe case of dehydration and talk about what happens there. So we already talked about the signs and symptoms of dehydration. So one of the signs is that you have a cottony mouth, that your oral mucosa is very, very tacky, uh, your skin is a little bit flushed, uh, you're not peeing a lot. You'll notice that when you're dehydrated, you hardly pee at all, it's called oligouria. And this might lead to weight loss if you're severely, severely dehydrated, confusion, uh, shock, all these kinds of things that are not very good. Okay, so let's take a look at a scenario where somebody has become severely dehydrated. We've got this guy, we'll call him Jake. He's been running around Tantalus all day long, training for the Ironman Marathon. He only brought one water bottle with him, so he's not very well hydrated to begin with. But he's running around, he's losing a lot of moisture through perspiration, also through breathing, insensible water loss. All these things are happening, and so more and more water is being pulled out of the extracellular compartment. Now remember that both the extracellular and intracellular compartment have a balanced amount of uh, electrolytes or salts. They're not necessarily the same salts, but they are osmotically balanced. So initially we have balance between these two compartments, but as I pull more and more water out of the extracellular compartment, which comprises the interstitial fluid and the blood, as I draw water out, the solute that remains makes that compartment more salty than the intracellular compartment. And when that happens, the more salt in the extracellular compartment, what does that salt do? Well, that's right, it sucks. It's actually gonna suck water out of the intracellular compartment to balance the higher than normal salt in the extracellular compartment. That's gonna cause our cells to shrink, which is not good. So how do we detect dehydration in our patients? Well, one way you can look for skin turgor. You simply pull up their hand, pinch the back of their hand, and you see if the skin tense. If the skin goes back to its normal position very, very quickly, probably not dehydrated, but if we have some pronounced tinting where it's staying sort of up for a long time like that, that is a good indication the patient is dehydrated. All right, let's look at the opposite situation. Look at, let's look at the consequences of hypotonic hydration. So hypo meaning below, tonic meaning solute concentration. So let's say we had somebody that was initially outside, they were worried they were becoming dehydrated, and so they came back in and they drank five gallons of water. You might say, oh, this is ridiculous. Nobody will ever do that. Well, I'll talk about this in just a second. 
let's say if they do, this is going to cause an excess accumulation of fluid within the extracellular compartment. Now remember, the extracellular compartment and intracellular compartment both have a balanced sort of concentration of solutes. We'll put three salts out here and three salts in here. Now what happens though is as I add more water to the extracellular compartment, the osmotic pressure of these three salt ions is going to become diluted. So essentially it's going to feel like there's more salt inside the cell. And if there's more salt inside the cell, what does that salt do? That's right, it sucks. That's going to suck the excess water from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment. And the cells are going to swell and potentially burst. So we call this process water intoxication. It can be deadly and it results because somebody drinks too much of a deionized or distilled water too quickly so the kidneys can't deal with it. Uh, if we have time to treat this person, we're actually going to treat them by giving them, that's right, salt, hypertonic saline. But you might not think that you can die from drinking too much water, but you can. So this sounds like an urban legend, but it's not. It is possible to kill oneself by drinking too much water. So the paper it left actually talks about four or five different cases of military recruits who have died in the last 20 years as a result of what we call water intoxication. And principally this results because somebody's initially out, you know, working out or something like that and they feel dehydrated and they overhydrate. And by overhydrate, I'm not saying they drank another liter too much or whatever. Some of these guys were drinking as much as 10 to 22 quarts. Uh, one guy I think drank almost the equivalent of five gallons over a short period of time. I don't even know how that's possible. But anyway, it does result in this sort of water intoxication, causes the cells to swell and potentially burst and these individuals died. Uh, more recently, I think back in uh, 2007, we had uh, th this woman and she was on a radio show and they were having a contest called Hold Your Wii, your urine, for a WII, a Wii gaming console. And basically what they had to do is the contestants had to drink uh, water and whoever could drink the most water without urinating won the gaming console. Well, this woman who's pretty thin and things like that, she drank about two gallons of water relatively quickly before her kidneys could handle it. She went home with a raging headache and ended up dying as a result of water intoxication. Now, because of her death, the radio station went out of business and the husband won about $16.5 million in a lawsuit. But suffice it to say, it is possible to have too little, too little water, but you also can have too much water as well. Okay, let's talk about how water balance is regulated in the body. It's regulated again through the hypothalamus. That was the part of the brain that generated the thirst reflex, but it also controls a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, and ADH is stored in the posterior pituitary, and the stimulus for ADH release as an increase in plasma osmolality. So as we become dehydrated, our blood plasma becomes proportionally more salty. When that happens, we secrete ADH from our posterior pituitary, that ADH travels to the collecting ducts of our kidneys and it inserts these things called aquaporins. Aquaporins are basically water doors that allow more of the water that was in that collecting duct to move out and be reabsorbed back in the bloodstream. So it is basically a water conserving mechanism and as a result of this ADH, we produce less urine and the urine that we produce is a lot more concentrated. And all that water that was going to become part of the urine now rejoins the blood volume. Now we're going to talk about electrolyte balance. Remember electrolytes are basically salts for the most part. And these are things that when we add them to a aqueous solution dissociate into a positive and a negative ion. And these salts are important because they control the movement of fluids through osmotic pressure. And principally the way that salts enter our body is through our diet, right? If we eat salty food, it has a lot of sodium chloride in it, and it leaves the body in a variety of ways. It could be through perspiration, right? Sweat is salty. Uh, it also leaves the body through urination, and it can leave the body through defecation uh, as well. So we're going to talk about the electrolyte balance in the body. So once again, we're showing the five or six most important electrolytes in the human body. The ones that are coated in blue are most important in the extracellular fluids, such as the blood and also the interstitial fluid, and the ones in orange are most important in the intracellular environment. So big take home message here is that potassium is the major cation inside the blood cells or inside the body cells, and 
phosphate as the major anion inside of body cells. If we look at extracellular fluid, such as uh, interstitial fluid or blood, sodium is the important cation and chloride is the important anion. Now your book goes through all these details with each of these electrolytes talking about, well, this is why sodium's important. This is why chloride is important. If you have too much chloride, this is what happens. If you have too little chloride, this is what happens. Well, we've got about seven or eight of those there, and that would be a very, very long story. So we're gonna look simply at sodium, which is probably the most important of the electrolytes, but realize the other ones are very important too. So sodium has to be probably the most important ion in the extracellular fluid. It's definitely the most abundant cation, and it generates the majority of osmotic pressure within the extracellular fluid. And this is important because the sodium levels determine the volume of the extracellular fluid, of our interstitial fluid, and also of our plasma, our intervascular fluid. And this is important because changes in the blood volume can affect blood pressure. And you know, if your blood pressure goes too high, well, that's not good. And if it goes too low, that's not good either. Now, sodium levels are regulated in part by aldosterone as well as atrial natriuretic peptide. So we're going to look first at aldosterone. Now, aldosterone is produced by the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, and it's produced in response to decreased amounts of sodium. So when we have increased levels of aldosterone, we will reabsorb sodium at the distal convoluted tubule of the nephron and excrete potassium. So here is the feedback loop governing the production of aldosterone. First of all, let's take a look at what the stimulus for aldosterone secretion might be. Well, it could be that we have lower than normal levels of body sodium. This could be because we've lost them in the urine. In that case, that's gonna stimulate the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, okay? Aldosterone is then going to travel to our kidney tubules where it has an effect on our distal convoluted tubule. That's gonna increase sodium reabsorption and remember, sodium is an electrolyte and sodium is a solute. And what do solutes do? Well, they suck. So that's also gonna pull some water with it as well. So in reabsorbing more sodium, we're also gonna reabsorb more water. And it's also going to facilitate the excretion or secretion of potassium into the urine. So we're gonna be producing or excreting more potassium into the urine in order to restore homeostasis. Our second hormone here is atrial natriuretic peptide, and this is produced by the atria in response to excessive stretch or increased amounts of venous return. So this diagram shows the feedback loop for atrial natriuretic peptide. Remember that the stimulus for ANP secretion was increased amounts of blood returning to the atria of the heart. As the atria are stretched, they're gonna then secrete atrial natriuretic peptide, and this is gonna have varying effects. First of all, it's gonna reduce ADH release from the hypothalamus and posterior pituitary. That's going to result in less water reabsorption and less sodium reabsorption at the collecting duct. At the same time, it's also going to reduce the amount of aldosterone secreted by the uh, adrenal cortex. That again is going to result in less sodium reabsorption, which is going to result in a loss of blood volume, which is going to result in a reduction in blood pressure. So simply put, atrial natriuretic peptide is produced at times when we have a greater than normal blood volume or greater than normal plasma volume. And as a result of its secretion, we reduce the amount of fluid and we also reduce the amount of sodium uh, that's conserved within the bloodstream. Now we're gonna talk about the acid-base balance of the body. We said before that electrolytes were things that could dissociate into a positive and negatively charged uh, ion and that most of these are salts. But indeed, some of these are acids or bases. So these are things that affect the pH of the body. Now, the normal pH of blood differs between around 7.35 and 7.45. If we go below 7.35, we say that we are in acidosis. If we go above 7.45, we say that we are in alkalosis. So we don't wanna be in either of these scenarios. Now you might be asking yourself, where does the hydrogen ion, where does the acid come from in our body? Well, a lot of it is produced by our metabolism. As we break down foods like carbohydrates and proteins and fatty acids, we liberate hydrogen ions uh, into the bloodstream. Now, if left unchecked, these hydrogen ions that were generated through metabolism could push the blood pH into dangerously low levels. Fortunately for us, we have three different buffer systems which can help to resist changes in the pH. These include a chemical buffer system, 
as well as a respiratory and renal mechanisms for regulating the pH as well. Let's talk about how these work. Before we can talk about how the chemical buffering system works, we need to review a little bit of acid and base terminology. A strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, is an acid that, when added to water, dissociates completely into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. So this acid is going to have an extreme effect on the pH of the solution, causing it to go down. On the other hand, a weak acid, like we see at right, which is carbonic acid, when that's added to water, it dissociates only partially, forming some hydrogen ions and some bicarbonate ions, but a lot of it fails to dissociate and remains as carbonic acid. So weak acids and weak bases, because they only partially dissociate, are actually really good buffer systems. They can scavenge up excess hydrogen ions or scavenge up excess hydroxyl ions. And this helps to minimize changes in the pH of the local solution. So our chemical buffers are all weak acids or weak bases. And these chemical buffers act to resist changes in pH by scavenging up excess hydroxyl ions or hydrogen ions. So there are three main chemical buffers. First of all are the bicarbonate buffer system, which we'll talk about, and this is very important in the intracellular fluid as well as the extracellular fluid. We also have a phosphate buffer system, which we will not discuss, and finally we have a protein buffer system, which is important in the blood as well as inside the cells. So our protein buffering system is most important in the intracellular fluid that is inside the cells where we have lots of proteins, but it's also important inside the bloodstream where we have lots of plasma proteins. Now proteins are made up of amino acids and amino acids are amphoteric. That is they have positive and negatively charged ends that can act as weak acids or weak bases. Let's take a look and see how that works. Okay, let's take a look at how this protein buffering system might work. So first of all, in the very middle of the uh, screen, you can see a normal amino acid at a normal pH. It has two different groups here, an amino acid group, NH2, and a carboxylic acid group, COOH. Now let's see what happens to this amino acid if we add it to a alkaline condition. So that's going to go to the right side of the screen. So if the conditions around that amino acid becomes more alkaline, that carboxylic acid group can lose an extra hydrogen ion. So you can see that hydrogen ion popped off, and when that hydrogen ion pops off, it helps to neutralize any base in solution to help bring that pH back down to the set point. Now let's take a look at the right side of the screen. Imagine that we put our amino acid into a situation where we have an accumulation of hydrogen ions. That should bring our pH down, but now let's look what happens. When that extra hydrogen ions start to float around our protein, that amino acid can grab up that extra hydrogen ion and bind it to our amino group, which is the NH2 group. Again, this helps to buffer the pH and helps to resist the pH from going down when we have too much hydrogen ions in solution. So just to remember, the protein buffering system was most important inside the cells, intracellular, but it was also important in the extracellular space when we're talking about the blood plasma. Okay, now we're going to talk about our bicarbonate buffering system. Remember a couple chapters ago we talked about bicarbonate and that it was an important buffer that was secreted by the pancreas to help bring the stomach pH back up to a reasonable pH of around 2. Well, here within the bloodstream, it acts to buffer changes in pH, either negative or positive ones. So it's a very important buffer in the extracellular fluid. In fact, the only important buffer in the extracellular fluid, but it's also somewhat important in intracellular fluid as well. So let's talk about what happens when we combine our bicarbonate buffer system with a strong acid. So on the left hand side of the screen you can see that we have hydrochloric acid and hydrochloric acid is a very strong acid. That is it has a profound effect on the pH in most cases. But when that combines with our sodium bicarbonate on the other hand something special is going to happen. That's going to be converted into H2CO3 which is carbonic acid. Now carbonic acid is still an acid, but it's a weaker acid. And in the process, we also create the salt sodium chloride, which is right here. So in essence, our bicarbonate has scavenged up the strong acid, converted it into a weaker acid, and buffered this change in the pH. On the other hand, let's look at what happens if a strong base is added. Okay, here we have sodium hydroxide. This is the base you would add to somebody if you want to dissolve a body. Now that combines with here, carbonic acid to make sodium bicarbonate and water.
So again, the sodium bicarbonate has somewhat buffered the change that would have normally happened by adding a strong base to a solution. So chemical buffers, it's important to point out, they can't really eliminate excess acids or bases from the body. That is, they're only scavenging them up temporarily to resist the changes they would have in the pH. The acids and bases are still there. On the other hand, our physiological buffer systems, such as our respiratory system and our renal system, can actively excrete uh, acids or bases from the body. Now we're gonna talk about respiratory regulation of hydrogen ions and pH. Now remember that CO2 is produced by the metabolism of food and that when we combine CO2 with water, we get something called carbonic acid. And like most acids, that acid dissociates into hydrogen ions, which reduces the pH. So by controlling the amount of CO2 in the blood, we can also control the pH. Let's take a closer look. In order to understand how the respiratory buffering system might work, let's take a look at two different scenarios. Okay, so here's scenario number one. Imagine that we have an excess amount of CO2 in the bloodstream. So excess amount of CO2 would be termed hypercapnia, an excess amount of CO2 in the bloodstream. Now what's gonna happen? Well, that CO2 here will combine with water to form something called carbonic acid, H2CO3. That carbonic acid will dissociate partially into hydrogen ions. And as the level of hydrogen ions increase, the pH will go down. So big picture here is the more CO2 that accumulates in the blood, the more hydrogen ions I have and the lower the pH goes. Okay, so how do I combat this? How do I restore homeostasis? Well, it's simple, just breathe. By breathing deeper and more frequently, we purge CO2 from our system and we're able to uh, drive the pH back up into normal levels. Now let's take a look at scenario number two. Let's imagine that we have a lower than normal amount of CO2 in the bloodstream. This results in a situation called hypocapnia. Hypocapnia means not having enough CO2. This often results because people will hyperventilate when they are anxious or scared or hysterical. And when they hyperventilate, <sighs> they actually drive off excess amounts of CO2 from the body. And this results in a drop in the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood because we're purging CO2, which results in an increase in pH of the bloodstream. Essentially, we send ourselves into respiratory alkalosis. So how do we restore homeostasis? Well, this is the situation you've seen on TV where somebody is breathing into a bag. They're breathing into a bag because they're upset. And when they're upset, they're hyperventilating and they're driving off CO2 from their body. So they're becoming alkalosis, they're having alkalosis. And by breathing into a bag, we can then begin to breathe back some of the CO2 and that will cause our blood pH to go back down to normal levels. So the take home message is that the respiratory system can regulate blood pH by either driving off CO2 or holding on to CO2. If we get rid of excess CO2, that brings the pH levels back up by driving off hydrogen ions. If we hold on to CO2, our hydrogen ion level goes up, dropping the pH. And so oftentimes we can detect problems with the respiratory system by blood pHs. For example, if we have hypoventilation, somebody that's not breathing quickly enough or deep enough, they're gonna have hypercapnia, higher than normal levels of CO2, and that's gonna result in respiratory acidosis. On the other hand, if they're hyperventilating, breathing too fast, that's gonna drive off more CO2 than normal, resulting in hypocapnia and resulting in respiratory alkalosis. Okay, now we're gonna take a look at our final mechanism of regulating blood pH. We said before that we had our bicarbonate buffering system, but that didn't really help us get rid of hydrogen ions, but we could get rid of hydrogen ions by breathing out CO2 with a respiratory system, and the same can be said for the renal system as well. So the renal system can help us conserve bicarbonate ions and also get rid of hydrogen ions. So the process by which we recycle bicarbonate and excrete hydrogen ions within the kidney is pretty complex. I don't hold you responsible for the chemistry, but I do need you to know how it works uh, in essence. So let's take a look at step number one. So step number one is that CO2 combines with the uh, water in the kidney to form something called carbonic acid. So there it is, step number one. Very quickly, that carbonic acid in step two is gonna dissociate into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions.
the hydrogen ions are shunted into uh, the kidney tubule where they will be excreted in the urine, and the bicarbonate ions uh, end up going back in the bloodstream. Now this is an oversimplification. There's many more steps that happen after that, but this is a way in essence that we can kind of recycle our bicarbonate and at the same time get rid of a hydrogen ion as well. So like any other system in the body, the acid-base buffering system can have disorders or abnormalities, and we term these acidosis or alkalosis. So the question is, you have a patient that comes in the hospital, you test their blood, and it turns out their blood pH is below 7.35. So we can say that they are in acidosis. But the question is, what is the cause of this acidosis? Is it respiratory or is it metabolic? In order to determine this, you need to do a little sleuthing work. First of all, you need to look and find out a little bit about the blood CO2 levels, whether they're elevated or whether they're normal. Now let's say that the blood CO2 levels were above 45 millimeters of mercury. This would indicate hypercapnia, higher than normal levels of CO2, and this would suggest that our acidosis was caused by the respiratory system. Simply, the patient wasn't breathing deeply or quickly enough, so they had accumulation of CO2 in the blood, resulting in hypercapnia and a falling pH. So in this case, we would say the patient has uh, respiratory acidosis. On the other hand, if we test the blood pH and it turns out that it is alkaline, above 7.45, we, we then want to ask what the source of this alkalosis is. If we test the PCO2 in the patient and it turns out it's below 35 millimeters of mercury, we can say that that patient is in respiratory alkalosis. Simply, they've probably been hyperventilating too much because they're upset or scared or something like that. So the way that we can eliminate this is have them breathe back some of their CO2 by breathing into a bag. Okay, now let's take a look at metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. So your patients come in, their blood pH is below normal, they're acidotic, but you test their blood CO2 and it seems fine. So now you wanna look and say, it's probably metabolic acidosis. So metabolic acidosis is low blood pH, which is often caused by an imbalance in our bicarbonate buffering system. So causes of this could be one, drinking too much alcohol, never a good idea. That causes an accumulation of acetic acid, Number two could be excessive loss of bicarbonate. Let's say that you've had some diarrhea and you've lost a lot of bicarbonate in the stool, uh, in the urine as well, that could cause your blood pH to go down. The last thing is accumulation of lactic acid. Remember, lactic acid is produced by uh, anaerobic uh, fermentation that's happening in the cells. And this happens if you're exercising a whole lot, but more often if you are having an untreated diabetic episode where principally catabolizing fats and things like that and making ketone bodies. So this could all be causes of metabolic acidosis. On the other hand, metabolic alkalosis results in a higher blood pH. And the only way we can differentiate this from respiratory alkalosis is again, looking at the blood CO2 levels. If they're normal, but the blood is still alkaline, we wanna say it's probably metabolic. Well, what could cause that? Well, one of the most common causes is vomiting. When we vomit, we get rid of our stomach acid, and in order to make more stomach acid, we actually produce some bicarbonate. So go back to your digestive chapter and read about that alkaline tide that's created as we produce new, more stomach acid. So as you replace more acid, you're actually putting more bicarbonate in your bloodstream. A second cause could be over exuberant you know, consumption of antacids. If you're somebody that pumps pops and acids like my wife used to, you know, you just pop them like candy. This can result in metabolic alkalosis. And the treatment here is simple, just stop taking the darn antacids.